I don't know. And now for our last segment, <laughs> here's something that we like to call hipster history. You probably haven't heard of it. Now, this story I saw on Twitter because of Steve Saylor, who is an alt-right journalist, and it is a fascinating story of who he considers to be our greatest vice president. Do we not have the, the do we not have the uh, text? Oh, yeah. Uh, the text? Yeah, it's... What text? Hold on. The, all the message I sent to you guys? About Richard Mentor Johnson? Did it not get sent? I'll just read it from my phone. There it is. Okay. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson, he was, let's have his picture up here. He was the vice president under Martin Van Buren from 1837 to 1841. There he is. Not counting a nine month leave of absence he took from the vice presidency to manage his tavern. And now we're back at the Cleopatra stuff, okay. He was elected with the campaign slogan, Rumpsy Dumpsy, Rumpsy Dumpsy, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh. Tecumseh? Uh, I don't, this is obviously a reference to killing Native Americans. It's also kind of, uh, I'm no linguist, but it's interesting to see, this probably speaks to the dialect of the time, if it must have rhymed back then, because now it doesn't. He belonged to a shadowy dynasty in the Western Cotton Belt known as the Family, was backed for the vice presidency in 1836 by both Andrew Jackson and Davy Crockett, not Tecumseh, I'm guessing, but was when he was dropped from the Democratic re-election ticket in 1840, he ran for re-election anyway. According to Wikipedia, his rambling, incoherent speeches, maybe in part due to the stuff from the tavern, on the re-election trail were poorly received and touched off a riot in Cleveland. Uh, Johnson still ended up winning 48 electoral votes in 1840 as an independent candidate for vice president, which is more than every libertarian candidate ever combined. And that's not too bad. I mean, very few people have run for vice president on their own. I don't think that's a thing. Uh, he failed in re-election to the Senate in uh, 1828 when he tried to introduce his daughters by his, quote, octoroon slave wife into polite society. He pointed out that, quote, unlike Jefferson, Clay, Poindexter, and others, I married my wife under the eyes of God and apparently he has found no objections. Now, as a United States Senator, his biggest project, I'm not making this up, was a campaign from 1822 to 1823 to fund a US government expedition to explore and conquer the inside of the earth because he was an advocate of his friend John C. Sims' hollow earth theory. Uh, John Sims is from uh, the Cleveland area. All that's left of this moment in American history is the hollow earth monument in Hamilton, Ohio. We have a picture of that. There it is. So Sims argued that the earth and the 1800s in America, by the way, were a bonkers time. All of that shit is swept under the rugs. People focus on the Civil War, Reconstruction, Uncle Tom's Cabin. There were so many little crazy movements that are like Oneida, look that up, They're, that are like, hilarious. And, and as science was becoming a thing, they didn't really know what it was. So there's all these whack job theories. This is one of them. So Sims's hollow earth theory argued that the earth, and in fact, all celestial bodies, isn't a solid, a solid ball, but a hollow shell, which contains a set of smaller concentric shells, which are all a few thousand miles thick. Each one is open at the two poles, which are giant gaping holes thousands of miles across. Put out that picture again. That's supposed to be like the North Pole. So the Earth is basically an asshole. Each one is open. Okay, so the edges of the hole are rounded. So you could walk up to the hole, keep going around the rim, and wind up all the way around on the inside surface. If you did, you might not even notice because the interior is just as warm, well-lit, and habitable as the outside. And he said that the inner inside, at, or at the very least, the inside of the outermost shell would have plants, animals, lakes, and oceans, just like our side. Okay, now, 
Uh, the genius in his theory is that he had a bunch of explanations for why this hasn't been discovered before and evidence for why it is true. The rims of the pole holes, which he called verges, were conveniently placed just past where people had explored to this point. And for an explorer wandering around the area, the lip would look conveniently similar to what you'd see on a completely solid ball of dirt, right? So you got a ball of dirt, you're at the edge, you're not going to see past under it. So he contended the very tip of the verge would be the coldest, iciest place on Earth, and it warms up as you head past the rim into the interior. He also argued that an explorer could head north towards the big hole, <laughs> walk up to and along the verge with the mistaken impression he'd reached the North Pole, then head back south at some other longitude, incorrectly convinced that he'd reached the very top of a solid sphere. It's like if you're walking a balloon, right? You think it's flat because the, the balloon is curving. So with this, even though it's kind of like a curved balloon, you think it's a straight line. Um, keep scrolling up. Uh, more, more. Okay, so here's some more bits of evidence that he has. Number one. There are great schools of fish that migrate north every season and don't come back in the south, thereby violating the law of conservation of seafood. He argued the fish simply swam around the rim into the interior oceans. They're just doing laps around the earth. That's number one. Number two, notice that it's colder in the Midwest, America's Midwest, than parts of Europe at the same latitude. London is further north than Duluth. He said it's because the northern hole dips further south over North America and of course, the closer you are to the verge, the colder it gets. And the northern verge, for some reason, is centered on magnetic north instead of true north. And finally, there's all this crap washing out of the ocean along the north shores of Europe, driftwood trees that look tropical in nature. So he thought they were coughed up from the temperate inner oceans. Why they weren't just coughed up from stuff from the south, south other, uh, southern ocean on the outside, I don't know. But that's the theory. He even wrote a book about this, which is public domain, which I was going to download and not read. Uh, his name is Sims, S-Y-M-M-E-S. If someone wants to read it, go ahead. There was a lot of this Hollow Earth literature uh, at the time, uh, and some of them became famous, and some, like his, have received the dustbin of history. So on that note, 